And what it means to be embodied is just that um, there's a reliable set of causal connections between a particular body and a particular mind's mental states. You become disembodied when the causal connections to a physical body are broken. So here to discuss substance dualism with me is Michael Humer, author of many wonderful books like Knowledge, Reality, and Value, Ethical Intuitionism, Understanding Knowledge, as well as several others. And Dr. Humer has been a guest previously. He's here collecting his three-time guest challenge coin, a coveted honor. So thank you for coming on. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So, I mean, I just have to note, like, straight out of the gate that you're not a theist or, or religious. Um which I guess, you know, is kind of a central point I'm trying to make here is that there are other reasons <laughs> to be a dualist, you know, other than just the standard kind of religious reasons. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, what do you draw attention to mostly like subjectivity, personal identity, um, free will? Is there anything else that you think a soul does a better job explaining? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm conscious <laughs> and, uh, and it's very strange that we're conscious. <laughs> There's, Right, really, nobody knows why. Okay, but when you think about the nature of consciousness, it doesn't appear to be a physical phenomenon, right? And you know, somebody asks you to name something that isn't physical, like you know, this seems like the paradigm example, you know, like a thought or a feeling. Like you know, if, if those don't count as non-physical, then what the hell does? Like you know, if you're saying if you're saying those are physical, then are you just using the word physical to mean anything, anything, everything? Because, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that's what it means. Anyway, you know, there are three features of us that I think are hard to explain in physicalistic terms, right? So, yeah, there's subjectivity, which is, or just the fact that we have qualia, the fact that there's a particular qualitative feel to mental states, or as Thomas Nagel puts it, there's something that it is like to be us. And by contrast, there's nothing that it's like to be a rock. Okay, and then the second feature is intentionality, which is, you know, our, some of our mental states refer to or represent things. And it's kind of hard to understand how representing something is a purely physical property. And then the third feature is that we have free will. And it's really hard to understand that in physical terms. So, like, just in the purely physical world, it seems like you've got the alternatives of something being random or being determined. but it, you know, hard to see how there's any option of having free will. So do you put any stock in the argument from reason? Um, do you think reason and like cognition are kind of hard to explain in physical terms? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, reasoning and cognition are um, forms of intentionality. So like, it's hard to, you know, in order to be reasoning, you have to be representing things. So it's hard to see in that sense, it's hard to see how you could be reasoning in a purely physicalistic world, you know, creates confusion. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, on the face of it, consciousness does not seem physical. <laughs> um, like there are, I mean, I guess like the first thing that uh, people kind of go through, I guess, other than maybe the hard problem is it's kind of a Leibniz's law kind of approach where there are like a half dozen features of consciousness you can think of off the top of your head that like, they, they just, like on the face of it, they don't seem physical. Like they, these things don't share all their properties. Consciousness is private, you know, and physical events are publicly observable. So, I mean, like, what is the next step in your experience? Like, what do physicalists say in response to that kind of, like, you know, more straightforward approach? Oh, I mean, I, I don't know what most physicalists say. I don't know. They, so, I mean, I think that traditionally people would say, you know, like, there are a lot of things that turn out to be identical with something that they don't initially appear to be. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, like, uh, well, OK, sounds don't initially appear to be compression waves in the atmosphere or something like that. But it, it turns out that that's the best scientific theory of what they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and whatever, uh, you know, people used to think water was an element and it turns out that it's made of hydrogen and oxygen, which is also really weird. It doesn't seem that way because like hydrogen and oxygen are gases. It just doesn't seem like they're part of water or whatever. Okay. Uh, lightning turns out to be a discharge of electrons. It doesn't look like that. Okay. Whatever. Um, and then, um, so that's supposed to be analogous to, oh, and consciousness turns out to be a brain process. And what brain process? Well, you know, we're still kind of working on that, okay, <laughs> or, or some type of brain processes. Um, and then, you know, I think like, I think Thomas Nagel kind of refuted this, right? Although he didn't claim to have refuted it. <laughs> he claimed that he was just 
saying that um, it was hard to understand how mental states could be identical to physical states. We didn't say that he proved that they couldn't be, okay? But anyway, like, well, okay, so when you discover that heat is really um, molecular motion, it's a random vibration of molecules, um, you might initially think, oh, but like that doesn't explain the feeling of heat. Like, okay, it, do it doesn't appear that way. And then the response to that is, yeah, but like the way it feels is just an effect on your mind that is produced by the motion of molecules. And because we're doing physics, we don't care about effects on your mind, so we don't have to explain how it feels. And so that's why the fact that it doesn't feel like it's molecular motion doesn't matter. But you cannot say that when you're trying to reduce consciousness. Like if the if the very subject matter is consciousness, you can't say, oh, well, that's just an effect produced on the minds of human observers. So we don't we don't care about that. <laughs> no, that's exactly what we care about. Right? <laughs> right, so like it's just really hard to see how how you would have a parallel with the explanation of the nature of consciousness. Yeah, no, that's why that's why I always loved Nagel, because he was kind of the one who was, I don't know most important to just getting me to take non-physicalism seriously in the first place. Oh, and speaking of, um, you know, just atheists who are non-physicalists, I mean, Thomas Nagel is an atheist and a non-physicalist, um, David Chalmers, Noam Chomsky, and, you know, obviously there are people from history like Schopenhauer or Nietzsche or something, but Anyway, just wanted to plant a flag there that, like, just because dualism is, is you know, or just non-physicalism in general is often considered, like, a religious view or something. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, by, by the way, okay, like, almost everyone throughout human history has been a dualist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> be, be, okay, and, like, you don't have to invoke religion to explain why they're a dualist, because physicalism is a radically counterintuitive view. And when I say counterintuitive, I don't mean it's slightly surprising, which appears to be what some people think I mean. <laughs> like, I mean, it's counterintuitive, like the view that cats are numbers is counterintuitive, <laughs> right? Like you're identifying two things that appear to be different ontological categories. Yeah. You're saying that they're the same thing. Like they're about as different as they could be. Like, like it's hard <laughs> to imagine things that are more different than, you know, the physical and the mental. Yeah. No, I, it's funny you say that because like sometimes I'll give the, I'll try to explain how it feels sometimes when physicalists are trying to give a reductive account. I'm like, it feels like you're trying to tell me that like bananas are meta ethics or something. Like it just seems almost like a category <laughs> mistake. Um, yeah. But yeah, they, uh, I, I just want to uh, note though, something you said a moment ago that dualism is the common sense view held by most people. And you know, some people try to argue it's not, but I think even most materialists would agree that like it is the common sense view held by most people, even if they wouldn't recognize some like really specific philosophical description of it or something. Um, I started reading your work on epistemology a couple of years ago, and you know, um, I've come to think phenomenal conservatism is correct. And if phenomenal conservatism is true, and we should take things that seem correct to us and proceed from there, and dualism is kind of the default view, then, you know, it seems like you should be okay with it until you've been given some grounds for doubt, like some reason for thinking otherwise. Um, so yeah, just if phenomenal conservatism provides us with the right way to proceed, then the burden seems like it's somewhat more on the non-dualist to uh, provide grounds for doubt. No, I mean, that, that's right. Um, and, you know, just in general... Like, it's not the case that uh, reductive identity theories have a, the presumption, right? Mm -hmm. No, they have the burden of proof. All right. So, like, you know, when they, um, when scientists decided that water was H2O, uh, one of the arguments was not, it's simpler to say it's H2O. <laughs> and, you know, nobody said, oh, well, like, just the burden of proof is on the people who say it isn't H2O. Like, right, That's, that was 0% of the argument. Like, nobody thought that. Okay, they needed specific scientific evidence. Like, well, if you have a sample of water, you can actually decompose it. If yeah. you apply an electric potential to it, you can actually produce hydrogen and oxygen bubbles. Mm -hmm. And the quantity of water decreases, okay? So tell me about an experiment like that with consciousness. <laughs> right? like, there, so there isn't right there are lame arguments okay so there are arguments like well we don't know where consciousness came from 
So which is true, fair enough. We don't know where it came from. <laughs> okay. But I mean, I don't regard that as being a huge problem. Like there, you can very easily know that stuff exists without knowing where it came from and like maybe having no idea where it could have come from. And by the way, I feel like I have no idea where time came from or space <laughs> or mm -hmm. matter or the whole universe. So, and you know, I'm not super worried about that. I don't know. And I, and it's not, it's not like you can't even think of a type of explanation. No, you can think of a type of explanation. We call them psychophysical laws. <laughs> like there could be a law of nature that when matter gets configured in a certain way, then it produces consciousness. Yeah. And you could say, well, I don't know why those laws of nature exist. And it's also true that I don't know why any of the laws of nature exist. <laughs> so like, that doesn't really seem like, I don't know. I mean, in some sense, that's a philosophical problem, but it doesn't seem like it's a good reason for rejecting the view. Yeah. Or assigning just as low of a credence. Like, I mean, even if you think that, oh, well, some other view has like some more theoretical virtues or something. I mean, the way that dualism is treated, at least in like contemporary intellectual culture, at least from my perspective, it seems they're just like, it's treated like it's not even remotely serious. And especially in, in particular, it seems like physicalism is like the default view. And yeah, I mean, you're always swimming upstream arguing against physicalism, it, it feels like. And as far as I can tell, there are like basically two major considerations for this like default favoring of materialism. Okay, are you ready for these knockdown arguments? It's going to be amazing. <laughs> so first, there are correlations between brain activity and mental activity. If I whack you in the head with a baseball bat, you won't think good no more. And this deductively proves the truth of materialism. <laughs> So that's number one. The second is physical causal closure. Um, every event in nature was tested, and it turns out that they all have physical causes. And the scientists also tested a bunch of non-physical things, and it turns out they don't have any causal influence at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, have we tested any of the non-physical things? <laughs> yes, we have. We've tested mental states, and it turns out that they do have effects. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what are you talking about? Just, uh, the causal closure argument to me is just like obvious, blatant question begging, right? It's like, I'm going to start with a principle, which is basically the negation of your view, right? I, I mean, unless, I don't know, unless you're talking to epiphenomenalists, right? Yeah. Most dualists are interactionists. So. I mean, part, you know, part of what seems to be going on is that people are relying on causal intuitions. So you have intuitions about what would cause what. And you just have an intuition that non-physical thing wouldn't cause a physical effect. Okay, but I would note that this is um, the only area in which most contemporary philosophers are causal rationalists. In all other areas, philosophers think that what causes what is a purely empirical contingent matter. And th that you can't just intuit what causes what. You have to look at empirical evidence, and then you just find out, okay, and... And that's basically the correct view. <laughs> I mean, you can't just tell by thinking about it. Like, yeah, well, you know, you find out the laws of nature by experimentation, okay? And so, and we don't know why anything else causes anything else. So, like, we don't know why masses produce a gravitational force. We have a law which describes, you know, whatever, how mass energy curves space-time, but we don't know why that would be the case. Or, or any of the other fundamental laws. So also, no. you know, there could be a law that, well, mental mental states do cause some physical effects. Yeah, it's like, I don't, especially when it comes to interaction, it's like, well, uh, clearly we have a perfect understanding of physical causation. And it's like, well, you know, how could a mental thing cause a, you know, physical event or something? It's like, how could a physical event <laughs> cause a physical event? Like, it's not like that's totally obvious either. Like, if you're, I mean, if you're any kind of, um, like, humane about causation, then I don't understand how you could even make that kind of argument, really, because isn't their view just that things happen and, like, there's not really anything that, like, makes it the case that this event follows this other event? Like, there's just this procession of, you know, conjunction or something? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess, like, you know, the really humane view of causation has it that... Um, there are no necessary connections between things and a yeah. law is just a summary of an accidental regularity which like it's just there's a bunch of stuff that goes together for no reason and then the law of nature just describes that uh now i guess 
I guess I assume that most people are not humans about causation. <laughs> I guess most of them think that there is there are necessary connections between things. But, you know, there being necessary connections still doesn't mean that you should be able to just intuitively see those connections, right? Right. Which you, you usually cannot, right? So either way, it's hard to see, like, what the issue is supposed to be for dualists here. Yeah. Um, just to return to the uh, what I think at least is, like, the main argument for physicalism, which is just that there are correlations. Um, yeah. And someone sent me um, your uh, your colleague Michael Tooley's argument from physical minds or something. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but um, the summary that, that he sent me was um, basically like an inference to the best explanation kind of argument and the things that they were trying to explain. It was basically nine different types of correlations. Like I can, I can read them out, but that's, that's all this. It's just different versions of the same thing over and over again. Like, you know, again, like brain damage causes, you know, it seems like it inhibits your cognition when you get older, you know, things change in your mind. Like if you take drugs, things change in your mind. Like there are just lots of different correlations that they point to and say, well, you know, this is like a matter of course, if physicalism or uh, property dualism is true, but it's not really a matter of course, if substance dualism is true, um, which I suppose is correct. Um, I yeah. don't. So what, what do you yeah. think? About that? I mean, um, you know, like sometimes when people state this argument, they state it in a contradictory way, right? Which is, um, oh, you know, brain states cause mental states. So brain states are mental states. But if we take the um, axiom that nothing causes itself, then the premise actually entails the negation of the conclusion, right? Yeah. Brain states cause mental states, nothing causes its, its itself. So brain states can't be mental states. Okay. But people who are being more careful wouldn't say that. They would just say, you know, when you have a brain state, you have a mental state at the same time, as far as we could tell. So that's evidence that the brain state is the mental state. I guess, I don't know, <laughs> but um, here's an alternative possibility. The brain state causes the mental state. Why can't it be that? <laughs> and right. There are systematic causal connections. So, okay. And um, so, you know, it's true that like on the dualist view, it's possible, whatever, it's conceptually and metaphysically possible that you have mental states without brain states, but we have empirical evidence that that's not the case because brain damage prevents you from having, you know, particular kinds of brain damage prevent you from having particular kinds of mental states. We can't test the hypothesis that um, destroying the entire brain stops your mental state. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it stops your behavior, but it's possible that you go on to an afterlife or something. We can't refute that. Because you can't talk, if there is an afterlife or whatever, if you turn into a spirit and go somewhere, we can't talk to that. So, okay, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, so like, but we do have evidence that your mental states will stop when your brain is destroyed because particular kinds of mental states stop when particular parts of the brain are damaged. Okay. So, um, and that's not predicted by dualism, but it's not incompatible with dualism either. So you could say that it's like a small amount of evidence against dualism. Because the probability of that being the case, given dualism, is lower. Right, okay. Yeah. I mean, you could at least imagine it being the case, like, that your soul just kind of controls your body like a marionette. And basically, no matter what damage you're doing to the body, like, the soul is just, like, totally fine. You know, yeah, that's, like, conceivable. Um, and it's not conceivable if physicalism is true. So, again, that's just kind of, like, weak um, evidence, you know, favoring some kind of monistic view or, like, property dualistic view. but. Like you said, it's yeah. obviously not incompatible. And once you, I mean, because just dualism by itself maybe doesn't say that much, but once you start adding these psychophysical laws, um, psychophysical laws, which by the way, you don't really get away from by being like a physicalist, as long as you're not like a type A physicalist, I feel like you still have to posit some kind of psychophysical law to explain the identity. Um, you know, like if you're the kind of physicalist who admits that it's conceivable that, you know, like zombies or whatever, or inverts, those are at least conceivable. Well, then it's epistemically possible that there could have been different psychophysical identities. And it seems like you're going to have to posit psychophysical laws anyway to explain those identities. Yeah. So I just don't really see how dualists are in that much yeah. worse of a position, you know? I think, um, you know, philosophers have this fallacy of thinking that, um, you know, thinking that you get some um, epistemological advantage by just asserting that something is a necessary truth, right? And so, like, we have a habit of saying, you know, taking things that are obviously contingent and then just asserting, well, I'm I'm saying that it's metaphysically necessary. Okay. So anyway, so yeah, the the correlations between mental states and 
physical states, you could say that there are causal laws, but oh no, that would have a complicated worldview. You're gonna have more complexity in your, in your theory. So instead, what we're gonna say is that they're identical. And then somebody's like, oh, but then isn't that equally complicated? And then the philosopher goes like, no, because I'm saying it's a metaphysically necessary truth. No, that doesn't make it less complicated <laughs> as long as you admit that it's not like analytic or something. So, you know, since we can't know it a priori, it's still from the epistemological standpoint, it's still equally complex. And you could just you could have said that, you know, just like the laws could have been something else. Well, there could have been something else that you said that mental states were identical to. I did want to ask you about um, emergence because I, I did not take dualism very seriously when I first started looking into philosophy of mind because I th I just thought that it would require some kind of like a strong emergence or like in uh, to philosophers it's just called emergence but like at least in popular discourse it's there's this distinction between strong and weak emergence. And weak emergence seems to mean something like supervenience or just like an, an ordinary reduction, like in the way that like, um, you know, water is H2O or like a lawn is just a bunch of blades of grass, you know, like arranged lawn wise. Like that's kind of what weak emergence seems to mean. And strong emergence just means emergence. Like there's something that's actually novel and like over and above its constituents. Um, so... I just somehow I got the impression somehow that like you'd have to believe in emergence to be a dualist. And yeah. I'm like, I just don't like emergence. Like it I, I admit that, you know, one of my friends kind of gradually got me to admit this over many, many months where it's like well, the world could be like that. <laughs> and it's like, okay, yeah, the world could be like that, but still I don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> I don't like emergence. I would rather not have to deal with it if it's possible to avoid it. And then um when I learned more about your views, I thought, well, oh, that that makes a lot of sense because it seems like uh, you're not invoking emergence at all. You think souls are eternal. Um, and then when the conditions are right, then the physical and the mental start to interact with each other. And that makes a lot more sense to me just to say that there's physical material and then there are these immaterial minds. And just when the conditions are right, they start to interact with each other. They can exert causal influence on each other. But it's not like the soul is like springing forth, you know, like it's just strongly yeah. emerging somehow out of, you know, a bunch of physical activity or something. Yeah. So, you know, like um, pe people periodically give, I don't know, examples of emergence or um, explanations of emergence that are trivial and uninteresting and dumb. Like, well, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say dumb, but they're just like, they make, they make it trivial that there's emergence, you know, like, um, okay, you know, like, uh, none of the atoms in this table is rectangular, but the table's rectangular. So that's an emergent property. So, okay, so it's trivial, <laughs> the existence of emergent property. But anyway, like, you know, philosophers in the, whatever, 20th century, maybe earlier, were interested in a stronger notion of emergence. And it was, it was roughly that, um, there could be properties that something had that result from the arrangement. There are causal consequences of the particular arrangement of the parts, but they couldn't have been predicted merely by looking at the parts and knowing how they were going to be arranged um, and knowing how the things behave in simpler combinations. So there's a, there's a particular sort of like complex configuration that you get that you can have of a system where some new property that wouldn't have been predicted um, emerges. Okay. Uh, and like, so that could be the nature of consciousness. And then, um, I, so I think that's basically the property dualists view that mental properties are a new kind of property. And there's just like some, right. Another way of putting it is, well, the theory of emergence is that there are emergent laws of nature. That is um, there are fundamental laws of nature that govern complex systems as opposed to the view that all the fundamental laws are just like about pairwise interactions or something between particles. All right. So anyway, okay. But um, like, I don't, I don't see that view as being very different from my view. Right. So like my view has it that, well, actually, you know, it's substance dualism. <laughs> there are two entities. There's like the body and then there's the mind, which is a non-physical entity, but you also have these laws that govern well, I guess, I guess there are fundamental laws that govern complex physical configurations and say that when you have this complex physical configuration, then it interacts with the mind in a certain way. So like, um, you know, about equally complex views, or I guess like maybe my view is more complex because there's also 
because there's more entities because there's also a mind. Um, but anyway. I mean, I guess I, I just, I don't know where the soul is coming from on the emergentist picture. Like it, it seems like there was no soul and there was no like proto soul. Like there was no, like it, it I'm not saying it like violates conservation of energy or something. But I'm just saying like, <laughs> it does seem to involve like a brand new thing kind of springing into existence ex nihilo. And I don't understand, even if you just say, well, there's a law of nature that something yeah. springs into existence ex nihilo. I still am more satisfied by your picture where it's like, no, there are these eternal souls that just yeah. start to interact once, you know, and that's also dictated by psychophysical law, but it still seems different to me. Yeah. I mean, the emergentists and property dualists would not say that there are souls. Right. So they wouldn't say that souls are created. Rather, they would say that mental states are generated, but the mental states are properties of um, the person. They would say that is, there's a single object called the person, which has both physical and mental properties. So no new entity was created when you but became. The, but there are these irreducible physical properties, though. I mean, don't those? I mean, it's not a soul, but still. You mean irreducible mental properties? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, but they're not properties of another entity. So, right, so they're properties of your brain. So, like, your brain is having conscious experiences, even though conscious experiences are not, or I don't know, I don't know if it's the brain or if it's just the whole the whole body. But anyway, you know, the, the physical object is having these non-physical properties. And so you don't have to explain how anything came into existence. Um, does emergence factor into your worldview at any other point? or? Um... I mean, because you're saying this isn't really different from emergence, but you're you're not an emergentist, though. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, so um, like I think there have to be psychophysical laws, and so and the, they're not laws that govern um, the simplest things, right? So they're laws that only come into play when you have a complex configuration. And I don't know what the configuration is, but it's something that happens in the brain, right? And so, okay. like, I guess that, like, I guess that's emergence. Like, I guess if it, if it's like a novel, like, force or novel causal powers or novel entities that are coming about later, I mean, wouldn't that basically count as emergent? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, um, you know, so like, it's it's not that a new entity comes about, but new. Um, states come about mental states come about hmm. right so i i guess um yeah well um i still don't like emergence <laughs> it's still, i mean maybe i'm just not putting it right but there's just something about it that seems um harder for me to accept i guess um so yeah. do you just not have that intuition then well um you know like it seems like the world could be this way <laughs> And then if it could be this way, then we have to look at the evidence and then is the evidence that it is that way? Oh, well, it kind of is, right? Because I don't see how else you explain why there's consciousness. Um, yeah, you know, like I, I mean, I used to think, well, there's something, like one thought that I had was, well, there's something weird about emergence because like maybe the view presumes that um, sort of that nature comes pre-divided because like, um, nature cares what the configuration of the system is, but like actually, there are in nature there are no lines around systems. <laughs> like there's there's the entire universe, and there are elementary particles. But like, um, right? But you know, I think that's that's maybe a spurious objection, right? So I want to ask you about Sean Carroll's argument against. I mean, his argument against pretty much everything, but um, specifically against dualism. Um, because it's kind of related to this emergentist stuff. So he's very strongly opposed to strong emergence. Um, and he's partly responsible for that distinction as well, the weak and strong emergence thing that everyone uses. But he says, like, look, the core theory, you know, the standard model, like these are pretty like adequate descriptions of the everyday world. And uh, if there were these novel, you know, forces or properties or or entities or whatever that were like coming about at macroscopic levels of reality, you know, at higher levels of organization, there are these new principles or something. He's like, well, look, we would have noticed them by now. 
So the fact that the standard model is like, you know, a, that it worked, it's never been like violent. There's no experimental results that say that it's wrong, you know, at least as concerns the everyday world. So that basically proves that there are no emergent forces. Wow, okay. But, uh, but we have seen these things. <laughs> we call them mental states. <laughs> I'm aware of them by direct introspection. So, right. I mean, it seems like the form of argument is something like, well, there aren't any other examples Right. So I've got a theory and there are no anomalies other than the thing that you, my dialectical opponent, are saying. <laughs> the anomaly. Okay, fair enough. Like if there's only one, maybe if there's only one anomaly, then you try to sweep it under the rug rather than saying the theory is incomplete. But um, it's a really big one. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we're very certain that it's real. <laughs> like I'm more certain that consciousness is real than anything else. Um. Like and has the, causal effects, I guess, because you could still sort of be, I don't know, some kind of epiphenomenalist, I guess, on his view. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I regard epiphenomenalism as crazy. Um, <laughs> like the craziest view is rejecting consciousness. And like, mm -hmm. I think it's more reasonable to reject physical reality than to reject consciousness <laughs> because, you know, because of Descartes, right? So what Descartes taught us, right? You could be wrong. It's extremely unlikely, but you could be wrong about the existence of the world outside you, but you can't be wrong about your consciousness. So anyway, okay, but after that, so after the um, after the insane views of rejecting consciousness or rejecting physical reality, the next most insane view is probably epi epiphenomenalism. And like <laughs> your mental states don't have any effect on anything. So, okay, well, what's the evidence that our mental states affect things? I don't know. It's just like the evidence of any other causal connection, right? Like. You do the one thing and then you observe the effect. It just happens over and over again. Okay. And by the way, like if you think that, well, okay, like the epiphenomenalists say, well, no, what's actually happening is that there's a brain state that's the common cause of your mental state and your behavior. So that's why there's a correlation between your mental states and your behavior. Okay. That's a possible explanation. But notice that according to that explanation, the fact that you have mental states doesn't have anything to do with why you're saying that you have mental states. Also, by the way, the fact that other people have mental states has no connection, right? There's no causal connection to their statements. So then how could you, um, how could you know what mental states other people have? Yeah. And so you have no reason for thinking that they have any other mental states because on your theory, if they didn't have mental states, they would behave the same way. Okay. And then... And then, you know, you imagine the epiphenomenalist saying, no, but my theory says that there's a correlation <laughs> because my theory says that the brain state that causes their behavior also causes their mental state. Okay. But what's the justification for that? There's no justification for that because in your theory, the mental states are not doing anything to explain anything that you observe. And it's like, you could assert that and just like, you could have it just as a principle of your theory that people have mental states, but then, you know, there could be an alternative theory that just cut that out Yeah, and, then, and says, you're the only one with the mental states, right? And like, there's no reason for thinking anyone else has them. So anyway, um, yeah. it's just an insane view. Yeah. You can't invoke mental states in the explanation, you know, which I mean, in your uh, forthcoming paper on, uh, you know, the problem of other minds. It's like, you know, inference to the best explanation is, you know, the, the right way to try to explain, you know, how we know that other people have minds. But yeah. if you can't invoke, you know, mental states like as as having any causal impact, then, you know, people's behavior becomes very hard to um, explain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, yeah, if you think about sort of um, if you think about viewing a person purely as a physical object it's like super hard to explain them. <laughs> so I am, you know, imagine that an alien comes down and like they see some people and the alien has no idea that people are conscious. And so he just tries to explain them as just like any other physical object. And then like, just think about how really, really difficult it would be <laughs> and like, and, and to predict their behavior. Right. And so, you know, an example I think of is like, um, I go to this room and there are all these students there and it happens on Monday and Wednesday. And, you know, um, it, well, Monday and Wednesday are not even not physical concepts. So it happens, you know, after two rotations of the earth <laughs> and then after another five rotations of the earth, <laughs> like that just keeps happening. And, you know, and then like as the alien is trying to figure out what's happening, they're like, oh, you know, maybe this, 
this these particular objects going to this location is caused by the rotation of the earth it's kind of weird i don't know you try to figure that out so and then you try to figure out how their bodies are detecting that the earth is rotating so then i don't know like okay maybe they're looking at the sun or something or maybe you know <laughs> sunlight is activating them in some way so okay so if the sun gets blocked then they won't go like that's not true <laughs> they go anyway <laughs> um anyway and then like why it stops after a particular time right like you know in in the summer <laughs> the beginning yeah. of the summer it stops you know, why did that happen anyway okay just sort of like what you would expect if you just tr treated them as physical objects and you didn't think they had mental states is totally different from what you actually expect you know given that they have mental states so, anyway. yeah yeah if you're trying to explain that complicated chemical reaction that you're describing like without any reference whatsoever to mental states it's like yeah i can't even imagine what the explanation would be yeah i mean like you know the the physicalist would say oh well no it's just like a really complicated thing about brains about about neurons firing in your brain in some complicated pattern and then they cause um contractions of your muscles in this complicated pattern whatever and like we could really explain this all ultimately if we knew enough about the brain okay now note as a side note in fact no one has ever done so mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway but we just have it as an article of faith that you can do so in principle okay but now anyway this is here's my point <laughs> like if you believe that then your theory implies that you a part of your theory has no explanatory value hmm. <laughs> if that's your view then also on your view the ascription of mental states to other people um, doesn't alter what they would do compared to if they were just f physical mechanisms without mental states. So there's no reason to right. believe they have mental states. Yeah. Okay. So is that what you mean in that paper where you say like, well, the identity theorist is not really any better off than the epiphenomenalist at the end of the day? Right. Yeah. Okay. I see. So, yeah, I mean, if they're saying, like, what is the evidence that uh, mental states have causal effects? It's like, I'm also kind of satisfied by the argument that, like, well, we're talking about it right now. <laughs> it seems to have a causal effect in the sense that we are talking about consciousness. And if you're an epiphenomenalist, then, I mean, first of all, that's a little surprising. But second of all, just to explain that, I feel like you have to ultimately go to the place where this conversation is not really about consciousness. Because consciousness has no effects about about anything on anything, yeah. so it can't really be about consciousness. This conversation. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, like if if mental phenomena are not causing you to make these utterances, like um, when you're angry, if that doesn't cause you to say "I'm angry," then maybe the words "I'm angry" don't actually refer to anger. Because mm -hmm. I <laughs> I think that would come out on like on many views about philosophy of language, right? That actually the word anger wouldn't refer to anger mm. because it has no role in producing that word we got off on this track about epiphenomenalism because of sean carroll's argument that you know there are no emergent properties and like a, um yeah or or causal powers or anything like that um the thing that at least i think is wrong with that argument is he's talking about the evidence from like particle accelerators and stuff but nobody thinks that your mind is like causing the particles in a particle accelerator to go, like go differently than they would otherwise <laughs> like just smashing these things together or something it's like but i don't i don't think that these macroscopic things are active on the microscopic level so how like how could that kind of evidence you know refute the emergentist view um you know for emergentists the only way to test it is to examine complex systems that are complex enough to have the emergent properties, which would be us. So the evidence would have to come from looking at humans. And then when you look at humans, actually, it does look like their mental states are affecting their behavior. Mm. If you look at anything simpler than humans, it doesn't, or whatever, simpler than animals, it doesn't look like that. But you wouldn't really expect that. Right? And I, you know, the best that I can make of it is that he's thinking, well, apart from consciousness, there aren't any exceptions to the causal closure of physics. And so, you know, if there's only one alleged exception, then you might think maybe that alleged exception is bogus. Like, if you have a theory that works except for one anomaly, then you think, well, maybe the anomaly is somehow bogus. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> In this case, uh, consciousness. <laughs> yeah. Right.
Yeah, but I mean, it's like, it's such a big anomaly, <laughs> such a big aspect of our experience, namely all of our experience, yeah. that it's, it's hard to sweep it under the rug. Um, a lot of opponents of dualism will report that they just don't know what you're talking about. Like, they don't understand the words you're using. Um, and it's hard to know where to go exactly when someone just keeps insisting that they don't understand the terms you're using. Um, but we can try. So, I mean, when you say immaterial substance, you know, like, w what is that? Oh, uh, I mean, I think people are being confused by the word substance, right? Mm -hmm. So, because in metaphysics, the word substance is just used to mean um, a thing that has independent existence or something like that. So, that is, um, philosophers distinguish substances from modes, and substances are thought to be the primary type of existent the primary type of thing that exists and modes are like modifications of substances okay so like red is a mode like there can't just be red by itself there has to be an object to have the property of redness okay so substances are just like the things that have properties that are not themselves properties of something else nor are they actions of something else or relations between something else okay so anyway so um, in ordinary English, substance might refer to material, like, like the substance and the material are the same thing. So then immaterial substance sounds bizarre. Okay. But anyway, it's just a technical term in metaphysics. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying there's a thing which exists on its own, right? That it, it's the type of thing that can have properties. It's not a modification of another thing. Um, so does this thing, the mind, um, does it exist in space? Like, is it extended in space? Like physical substances are extended in space? Um, yeah, no. So it doesn't have any, uh, it has no spatial properties, right? As far as I understand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where is your soul? It isn't anywhere. It's non-spatial, but it is in time. Yeah. Right. You can have an experience at time T1 and a different experience at T2. So it's, it's in time, but not in space. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, and, you know, you might think it's weird, but, uh, you know, it's also kind of intuitive. So, <laughs> no, somebody asked you like, okay, so you're having a thought. Okay. But like exactly where is the thought in space? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, all right. I'm thinking about uh, middle earth, which is a fictional location. My thought of middle earth is located where you might say, like, I don't know, maybe it's in my brain. Maybe it's where my brain is. <laughs> Like, okay, but exactly where? Like, is it in a particular part of the brain or is it in the whole brain? Does it have a shape? Because like, if it's in the whole brain, then I guess it's shaped like my brain. Mm -hmm. But like, it just it doesn't really seem like the thought has a shape and a size and all that. Right. But it does happen at a particular time. You know, if you yeah. say, when is my thought? It's like, oh, it was five minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I guess some one reason someone might push back is because, um, you know, the mind obviously exists in time. And um, if space and time are inextricably linked, then it's not at face value easy to see how you could have a substance existing in one, but not the other. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, so, you know, like, I guess in special relativity, you know, spa space and time are not two separate things. There's a single four dimensional thing called space time. And, um, you know, I just think that's wrong. <laughs> I think they are oh. two separate things. Um, space and time are separate. Uh, and like, well, I don't know, what's the evidence for that? I don't know. It's just like intuitively obvious, like space and time are just obviously completely different things. Um, anyway, so then you're like, oh, but what about all of the amazing evidence for relativity? Okay, what's the amazing evidence? Okay, and then sometimes people tell you some, some evidence that they heard about, but it has nothing to do with that claim. Okay, mm -hmm. like, so there could be evidence for some predictions of relativity, that, but it doesn't necessarily bear on every claim that's involved in relativity theory, right? So, okay, so people say, oh, well, like, this is, this is, I don't know, the most famous thing. Well, you can, like, fly an atomic clock around in jet airplanes really fast, and then when it comes down, the clock has lost a measurable amount of time compared to the clock that was on the Earth. Okay, and how does that show that space and time are not two different things? Like, it doesn't show that. Okay, it does. It shows a prediction of relativity, but it doesn't show the specific thing that we care about here. Interesting. Okay, so like the kind of time dilation experiments um, don't support the claim that is relevant to you here. Um, so does that make you like an A theorist instead of a B theorist? 
Um, I don't know. I keep confusing A with B because it's such a badly named distinction. Uh, I believe that the present exists. But the past and future don't exist. Oh, um, I, I mean, I didn't even... I don't even feel like I understand that um, debate. <laughs> so um, it, it appears that there's a sense in which the present is more real than the past, and maybe the past is more real than the future. And the future is more real than things that aren't ever even going to happen. <laughs> like a few, you know, the actual future is more real than merely possible futures. Okay, now, you know, if you ask me to explain what more real means, I don't really have an explanation of that. Uh, okay, but anyway, but I do think that there is there is a special moment called the present time that I'm directly aware of. It's not just like all the other times, right? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know anything about philosophy of time, so I'm also the worst person to, like, ask further questions about this. But, I mean, it, aren't those time dilation experiments supposed to show that there's that there's not, like, a privileged moment in time that, like, what is now for from one perspective is like a, a different from another perspective or something. Oh yeah. So, um, I, yeah, the thing in relativity is the thing that generates all of the, um, counterintuitive consequences, or as you might say, the absurd consequences <laughs> is that there's no preferred reference frame. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, in other words, like, People in different reference frames or people in different states of motion, but only inertial motion, people in different states of inertial motion will measure certain physical properties differently. Okay. And now it could be confirmed that people really will get different measurements. All right. So like the person on the airplane, when they measure the time difference between two events, they get a different result from the person on the ground who's measuring the time difference between the same two events. Okay, and then, you know, there are various other physical quantities. Okay, so like the length of an object will be measured differently by two different observers who are in different states of motion. So like all that can be experimentally verified. All right, but um, what cannot be verified and is a philosophical claim is, and um, no one is more correct than anyone else. Okay, so like there, there's no preferred reference frame, right? Meaning none of the sets of measurements is any better than any of the others, they're all equally correct, which entails that none of those properties exist absolutely. They only exist relative to an observer or relative to a state of motion or relative to a thing called a reference frame. Okay, so anyway, um, but here's an alternative. Maybe <laughs> there is a preferred reference frame. <laughs> and, okay, what's the evidence against that? Okay, and there's, most people have no idea. <laughs> And the answer is there is no evidence against that. It's intrinsically impossible to have evidence against that. Rather, the reason for rejecting it is that there's no proof that there is a preferred reference frame, <laughs> right? That is, people say, well, like if there was a preferred reference frame, there should be some experiment that you can do that detects it, and you you can't, right? Or like, or, you know, nobody has found a way of detecting the preferred reference frame, and according to our current understanding of the physical laws, there is no way to do it. So anyway. <laughs> Um, so then they just say, oh, so then you should reject that. But, um, you know, like, here's a philosophical reason why you shouldn't reject that. Like, well, like, if there are two measurements that are incompatible with each other, one of them has to be right and the other one has to be wrong, right? But like, if one, if one observer thinks an object is a meter long and the other one thinks that it's 1.1 meter long, then one of them's wrong. And the <laughs> reason I think that is one does not equal 1.1. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right. But anyway. Like, you know, it's not like, okay, these, the view isn't incoherent, right? They're not lo actually logically inconsistent. They would say, no, 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 it's one meter relative to this one observer, and it's 1.1 meters relative to the other observer. So it's not an inconsistent view, okay? It's not a logical contradiction, but that's super bizarre. Like, what does it mean for something to have a length relative to a person? Yeah, okay, and then like, well, what is it that I mean, you know, we're sort of like going off on a digression here? But anyway, no, it's like, interesting. Yeah, you know, I don't know. And all, so it exists relative to a person. Like, is that the view? So then, before there were people, there were no lengths. Hmm. Okay, they probably wouldn't want to say that. So like, oh no, 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 it's relative to a reference frame. Oh, okay, and what's a reference frame? And how many reference frames are there in this room? And they're like, <laughs> okay. 
And then if you read a physics book, it's like, oh, okay, a reference frame is a coordinate system. Oh, what's a coordinate system? It sounds like it's a way of measuring things that people created. So before there were people, there weren't any reference frames. Is that true? Like, okay. Um, or, you know, maybe oh, it's relative to a state of motion. Well, what if there's nobody in that state of motion? And in, in physical theory, it doesn't matter if there's anybody in that state of motion, right? There are infinitely many reference frames. Um, anyway, okay, but it's like super bizarre to think that physical properties are somehow like dependent on these objects called reference frames, which are either human created conventions or they're like purely abstract objects. They're not physical things, right? And so anyway, it's kind of weird. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember when we spoke a, a while ago about meta ethics you were just giving you gave an example of like an objective property and a subjective property like in the sense relevant to meta ethics and i think the example of an objective property you gave was like rectangularity or something like the, ta the table is rectangular um like regardless of uh you know how anyone feels about it and i remember i did like have like the fleeting thought i'm like well isn't that kind of thing supposed to be like relative to observers also because of general relativity or something but i was like oh i mean i, I get the point but you yeah. know that, that's interesting that like uh I, mean, I just i had no idea that um that you rejected that that's why i wanted to go down that that rabbit trail but yeah it's super interesting yeah yeah um so uh one of the main arguments for substance dualism has to do with personal identity and for a while i mean people make fun of me when i say this but like i did not really have strong intuitions about personal identity for the longest time so when people were saying like well you know here's an, an implication of accepting this view i'm like okay like i just don't really like all of it seems counterintuitive to me i don't know how to solve it but then um when i was reading knowledge reality and value um something about the argument you made it did kind of click with me where i'm like okay i think i'm finally seeing what people have been trying to get me to see about this but um you outlined four principles about the identity of persons and um i guess there's an there's an implicit fifth one and it's sort of like you know these are all jointly inconsistent yeah there's the book go buy it <laughs> um but it's like you know I, I like those kinds of arguments that say like okay here are like a set of propositions they're jointly inconsistent so which one are you going to reject? Because you have to reject one of them. And um, so, yeah, you have those four principles of identity. And I guess the fifth one implicitly is, you know, dualism is false. And like, that's the one you reject. Um, yeah. But yeah, do you want to, um, can we go through those those uh, four principles? Yeah, uh, see if I can remember. <laughs> All right, so uh, <laughs> I can read them off if it would uh, help. You can oh, you have it in them. front of you. <laughs> yeah, I've got it in front of me. Um, so the first one is identity is a one-to-one -one relation. Every being is identical with exactly one being. No one is ever identical to two beings. Yeah, that seems right, right? <laughs> like, that's sort of like, uh, it's just by definition, right? Identity is the relation that everything has to itself and nothing else. And that's just what we mean by identity. And when I, when I talk about personal identity, like, is something the same person or not? I mean that sense of identity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I'm just stipulating that that's, that that's what I mean. So, you know, like, um, there's a person called Mike Humor um 30 years ago is that person identical to this person that you're talking to now okay and what i mean by that is numerical identity yeah right. not qualitative identity because the immediate thought is like well in some ways no <laughs> like in in many ways no but i think you're you know there's yeah. like kind of an equivocation sometimes like well you're not really the same per like in many ways you are a different person it's like yeah. yeah but that's not the way that i mean <laughs> yeah yeah i don't mean literally different right like you know um uh if my name is on a, the deed of a house you know they signed 20 years ago um <laughs> i'm the same person in the sense that it's my house <laughs> it doesn't like it doesn't matter that i've accumulated more memories since then right okay so like we're not we're not asking like do have I gone undergone any changes? The question isn't like, do I have exactly the same personality and beliefs and desires that I had 20 years ago? We're just asking like, am like, you know, have I survived the last 20 years or did I die and get replaced by another person? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it wouldn't matter if it's like, Oh, well you signed the deed to that house. It's like, yeah, but he has amnesia. He doesn't remember signing it. It's like, well, it's still him though. Like <laughs> it still has how you couldn't just hit someone over the head, give them am amnesia and be like, that's no longer your house. <laughs> this is my house now. <laughs> oh. well, I, I don't know. I guess it would go to their heirs. So, like, if you're the heir of the person and you give them amnesia, do you get to inherit their house? No. <laughs> and, you know, actually, like, I mean, there, you know, 
it might not be completely obvious to everyone. Like, you know, does permanent loss of memory um, destroy your identity? Hmm. Right. Because I, I guess it was John Locke's view that you had to have continuity of memory in order to have continuity of the person in order for the person to keep existing. But anyway, like, okay, so like, here's an argument. You imagine somebody getting amnesia and uh, they can't remember, they, they've lost all their episodic memories. Okay. So they don't remember any of their past experiences. Uh, and this is a real phenomenon. It's not just a philosophical thought experiment. Okay. Now the people who get this, um, they don't lose the ability to talk or so they have memories in the sense that they have general knowledge they know how to talk and like they know facts about the world but they don't have knowledge about themselves or their experiences okay so anyway but those appear to be the kinds of um memories that would be relevant to your identity so have they lost their identity well then here's another interesting fact most of the people who get amnesia in that sense recover their memories within a few days or at most weeks okay so then after they recover their memories are they the same person and everyone says yes Okay, but so then that means that during the period when they had the amnesia, they were also the same person as the person before the amnesia, <laughs> right? So like if A is the person before they get amnesia, B is right after they get amnesia, and then C is after they recover their memories, well, everyone agrees that C is the same person as A, but also B is the same person as C. So by transitivity of identity, B has to be the same person as A. Okay, and then you think, oh, well, what about the case where they get amnesia, but they don't recover? Well, okay, so there's two stories, right? You know, A, there's person A, normal person, then there's B after they've gotten amnesia and they don't remember being A. Okay, and then there's two possible continuations. There's a continuation where they recover their memories and then there's a continuation where they don't recover their memories. Okay, but at point, you know, at the point where you have B, they're in the same state, regardless of what the future is going to hold. And so who you are shouldn't depend upon what is contingently going to happen in your future. So that means even for the person who's not going to recover their memories, they have to still be the same person as the original. Yeah. So, so um, you mentioned transitivity, which is the second principle. Identity is transitive. If X is identical with Y and Y is identical with Z, then X is identical with Z. And you said in the book that this is violated by the same people, the people who say like psychological continuity. So it matters, you know, memory theories and so on. Like you are the same person as long as you have psychological continuity and, you know, all the same memories and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Thomas Reed's original refutation of Locke was, okay, you know, have a person who's a child and then you have a person who's like a um, regular adult and then you have a person who's an old man. And, um, you know, like the middle-aged adult remembers being a child and the old man remembers being middle-aged, but the old man doesn't remember being a child. And so if you have to have memories of a particular time in order to be the same person, then you have a violation of transitivity. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Now, okay, you can avoid that by sort of like this stipulative technique by just saying, well, okay, I'm going to say it's the same person provided that there's a chain of, um, you know, going back to the first person. Right. Um, so, you know, there's there's a chain of stages where each stage remembers the previous stage and it goes from the old man all the way back to the to the child. OK, so like, OK, that's good. That gets that case right. Um, but I don't think that gets the amnesia case right. It's mm -hmm. like right after the person has the accident and they have amnesia, then this view implies that they're not the same person. These qualitative theories, like they do seem kind of vulnerable to like clone examples as well. Like if you just have someone who has all your memories and has you know, psychological continuity in the same way that you do. Well, it seems like, well, that's not me. That's like a clone of me. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, in some sense it is you. It's like, yeah, I get in some sense it is me, but not in that like numerical <laughs> identity. <Literally>. Sense. <laughs> like, it, and even in very important senses, like if there was a clone of me, it's like in almost every important sense, that is me, except for one, <laughs> which is kind of the question we're dealing with here, um, yeah. you know, personal identity. Yeah, the no branching condition is to rule out um, the cloning case, right? So, you know, imagine that somebody puts you, um, you know, puts you under general anesthetic, and then while you're asleep, you know, they do this thing to create a clone of you, and the clone, like, they copy the memories and information from your brain into the clone's brain, right? Which, you know, by the way, that's an additional step that has to be taken. Okay. But anyway, and also... I don't know. They've got some like kind of gene therapy thing that resets the telomeres. So like, actually he's your age. <laughs> All right, so anyway. Um, okay. And then both of you wake up from the operation at the same time. And like both of you have qualitatively the same experiences. 
Uh, and if you like, you know, they put you in rooms that look identical. <laughs> so you have the same experiences at, same, at the time. And then you both have quasi memories. <laughs> that is, you both think that you remember being the person before the surgery. Okay. And then on the psychological continuity theory, you're both identical to the original person. But this violates the first principle, which is identity is a one-to-one -one relation. Right. Like a thing can only be identical to one thing at a given time. There can't be two different things that are identical to each other. So anyway, oh, okay. So anyway, but then there's the no branching condition, which is, okay, you just take the continuity theory, but you say, but I'm stipulating that in order to be the same person, um, there has to not be another person existing at the same time who also has continuity with the original. Right. And so like that. So in the, in this scenario, both you and the clone would fail. Neither of you would be the original person, right? right. <laughs> and the fact that there are two, that means that neither can be the original. Right. right. And by the way, what's the reason for this? Well, it's because if you say one of them is the original, then you have to like have some criterion for which one is the real original person. And then like what you know, there's just not there's not a good answer to that unless you're ready to introduce souls. And if you introduce souls, then you don't need the continuity theory. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, it's it's like um it also just weirdly makes your existence depend on like what's going on, like what you might not even know about, like just what's going on elsewhere in the world, like, oh well, has the no branching condition, you know, been satisfied or something? It's like, oh, is there a clone of me somewhere? Like, I mean, why would that change anything about like whether you're the same person? Yeah. Like it seems like it shouldn't depend on on anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, you wake up from this operation. And then, you know, the like the theory is who you are, like who the person who's waking up in this bed in this room is actually depends upon what's happening in this other room, whether yeah. there's another person over there, because if it is, then you're not, then you're a new person. And if there isn't another person in the room, then you, you're the original person, right? And then, you know, you can imagine like, there's like, you know, say that you went into this voluntarily, okay, and then you had an enemy who wanted to kill you. And so, you know, like they could make sure that the copy is really good and then that would kill you. Mm. But then like if you had a friend who wanted to save your life, they just go, you know, to one of the copies and they introduce a defect in it. And then that saves your life. Like that's totally counterintuitive, right? <laughs> because, you know, if they made this defect, then there's, you know, one of them that doesn't have the perfect continuity. Yeah. And so then the other one is the original person. Um. So, you know, that's the uh, third principle, you know, identity is intrinsic, not extrinsic. So, you know, it just depends upon facts about you, not um, about not facts about other beings, which would be uh, pretty weird. Um, so the fourth condition is that identity is objective. If A is a person and B is a person, there is an objective fact as to whether A equals B. It's not subjective, indeterminate or a matter of convention, whether, for example, I exist in any given possible scenario. Yeah. And I mean, that's in there because there's some people who are, I don't know, kind of skeptical about personal identity or who think that it's um, a matter of convention. Now, um, I have some, you know, I guess somewhat skeptical or conventional views about the identity of other objects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like there's the ship of Theseus, which is this ship that gets little parts of it replaced gradually over a period of time. Like, you know, over a period of 10 years, each part of the ship has been replaced. OK, but only a small one small part of time. OK, and then there's a question, oh, is it the same ship at the end? OK, and then my view about that is, well, that's mostly a semantic question. Right. Which means it's really just a question of whether we want to call it the same ship or not. There's not like a deep underlying meta metaphysical fact to discover. And then I just want to say, yeah, but people are not like that. <laughs> there is a fact about whether you exist and it matters whether you whether you survive in a way that there isn't really a fact that matters about whether it's the same ship or not. Right. So if the ship of Theseus had a soul and it was the same soul, then it's like, well, yeah, it's the same ship. <laughs> it yeah. just has different physical parts, but it doesn't have a soul. So there's not really any fact of the matter. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, when I mentioned this, you know, uh, students frequently propose that maybe ships have souls. <laughs> like, OK, I mean, if ships have souls, then that would settle. Although we, you know, we don't have any way of knowing where the soul went. So we don't know if it's the same ship, but then there would be a metaphysical fact. And then, you know, it would also be really wrong to destroy ships and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I assume that that's not the case. So. So um, you think the mind doesn't have parts, right? Like it's indivisible or simple. Yeah. Yeah. 
and you know the physical world at least is like human life is as far as human life is concerned it's just not really like that you know um i don't think it's crazy to say that tables and chairs are just particles arranged table and chair wise and like our minds just kind of project those categories onto them um and i don't think it's crazy to say the same thing about like brains and bodies and spinal cords and stuff like they're just particles arranged in a particular shape and we have a category for that sort of structure but it's not like the universe knows there's a table here like there's no underlying metaphysical fact or something um and i feel like that's kind of isn't that kind of the uh where this gets its force from like okay the the soul is indivisible and simple it doesn't have parts it doesn't admit of borderline cases like a brain or a body or a spinal column does yeah 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 um yeah i mean if the soul were composite um then you could maybe have you could have cases like the ship of theseus where you replace a part of the soul and then replace another part of the soul mm -hmm. and then you could have there be no fact of the matter about whether there was the same soul or not um but in fact you know like conceptually i think that doesn't make sense that yeah. is I, I think there's no way for a soul to have parts um by the way descartes discussed this and you know at one point he says you know nor should you think that thinking feeling memory and so on are parts of the soul they're not parts of the soul because it's one and the same thing that thinks and remembers and feels and so on. Right. Okay. So like, it's just, um, the thing that has those mental states, you have like, you remember things and you also feel things. And so it's the same thing that has those functions. Yeah. So it, what you're saying is there's no, it, it couldn't be like indeterminate or a matter of social convention or like a semantic question or something, whether or not, you exist or whether or not you're having an experience in the same way that it could be indeterminate like whether or not you're in that brain state or something yeah um well uh may it could be indeterminate whether the brain that's in a particular state is the same as another brain yeah <laughs> it can't be indeterminate who is having an experience right like what mind is having the experience yeah As, you know like think about um just like what it would mean what it would be like what would it be like to be, uh, you know, neither having nor not having an experience or to have it be a merely semantic question, whether you're the one having an experience or not, what would that feel like? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so this fourth principle of, um, objectivity, you know, it's meant to, uh, you know, kind of rule out theory, you know, like if you say I am my brain or something, or I am my body, well, I mean, that seems to indicate that like your existence can kind of be indeterminate. Like, you know, it can be indeterminate whether a future being is you. So then it can be indeterminate whether or not you are having or not having an experience, but that just doesn't make any sense. Like what would it mean to neither fail to have an experience or, uh, you know, like not fail to have those experiences. It's like it's indeterminate it's somewhere in between those two yeah, things, yeah. but that just doesn't make any sense. So that's basically the reason for the fourth principle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, so, um, like there's a thought experiment that's supposed to kind of pump your intuition, right? Like, you know, you imagine that you're in one of these cases where it's indeterminate, whether something is you, right? Mm -hmm. So then, you know, you like, you have like really strong re or, you know, before this thing happens to you that is going to make it indeterminate whether you survive, you have really strong reasons for trying to get other people to talk as if it's going to be you, because that's going to enable you to survive. And if they talk a different way, then you're going to be dead. And so mm -hmm. like, you really got to try to get right. So like that's supposed to, and then you're supposed to just intuit that, no, that's, that's false, right? Yeah. There's like, um, it, it doesn't, does, does not matter how people talk. Okay. And this is, of course, like, you know, assuming that you have sort of prudential concern, right? That you have strong reason for caring about yourself. Um, but anyway, so like this principle, um, it, I think it rules out most physicalist theories of the person, right? Because most physicalist theories would be a person is a particular physical object. And it would be a macroscopic physical object, right? They wouldn't say that you're a, an elementary particle. Right. Yeah, elementary particles, by the way, they're like souls in that they're simple and indivisible, and therefore there aren't questions. There aren't um, cases where it's indeterminate whether you have the same particle. Yeah. Like, yes. I don't know. I didn't know enough about particles. But anyway. But oh, yeah. So, you know, all the physicalist theories are going to be that you're a macroscopic physical object. And for macroscopic physical objects, there are cases where it's indeterminate whether you have the same object and or, you know, it's a matter of convention. Right. That is like the question of whether you have the same physical object is just really a question about how we want to talk. 
And then you're supposed to have the intuitive reaction that that is not true about persons, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> then you get the crazy result where like you have the super strong um, prudential reasons to try to make people talk in a certain way. I did want to touch on your views about the afterlife. And then I have a couple of questions from the audience from uh, that I gathered beforehand. Um, is yeah. that all right? Just those two more sections? Let's do it. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, okay, so what happens when we die? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, like, uh, okay, my, my best guess is, well, you're going to be reincarnated at some time in the future. Uh, and it will either be instantaneous or it'll be in a ridiculously long period of time, like a Googleplex years. <laughs> okay. So I, I can't, can't estimate when it will happen. Anyway, the reason why it might be instantaneous is, you know, there are these people who believe in the multiverse. Okay. And so if, if there's a multiverse and if you can be incarnated in another universe, then uh, right after you die, there will probably be another universe where there's somebody who's a suitable receptacle for your soul. There's a body that's a re suitable receptacle for your soul. On the other hand, if there's only this universe, and then and also if we have to wait for, you know, okay, because like uh, the universe is going to go on for a long period of time, it's going to reach thermal equilibrium, and it's going to take an extremely long period of time for the universe to get back to a state that's similar to the state that it's currently in, right? A ridiculous time, like a Googleplex years or something like that. Okay, so if we have to wait for in this universe a body to appear that was extremely physically similar to your current body, that's going to take the ridiculously long period of time. So do you think that um, the soul being like indivisible and simple and everything, does that mean that it can't be destroyed? Um, I mean, it doesn't logically entail that it can't be destroyed, but uh, let's say it reduces the options for destroying it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and anyway, okay. Like, um, and my view is basically your soul always exists, but um, it won't do you much good. It doesn't do you much good to exist if you don't have a body, mm. because your body is what causes mental states in you. So you can exist while having no mental states, which isn't fun. It's not painful, though. It's just not fun. It's just not, you know, it's, it's just as good as not existing. Right? <laughs> So, I mean, does that mean that we're not like essentially conscious creatures because we could exist without being conscious for yeah. long, long periods of time? Yeah. So, you know, I take it that this happens when you fall asleep and you're not dreaming. You still exist, but you're not having any mental states. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you might think, uh, well, you know, what about, you know, but when you die, you not only stop having mental states, but you lose all your memories. Like, but, you know, remember the previous amnesia example which uh, hopefully convinced us that you can survive loss of your memories. Right? And so if you could survive temporary loss of your memories, then I, can, I think you can survive permanent loss of your memories. Mm -hmm. and, and then also the sleep example shows that you can survive not having mental states at a particular point in time. Okay, so death is just um, becoming unconscious and losing your memories permanently. Right, but you may later become conscious again without those memories. And so, but you know, that's, that's possible. <laughs> so you have a, you have a paper where you argue for this and um, I mean, it goes without saying, you know, like no one knows for sure what happens when you die, but we can at least work out the implications of different theories. So like if physicalism is true, we know what happens when we die. Um, you know, if Christianity is true, I guess I'm going to hell forever. Um, probably not actually but still it's like so i mean what are the uh like what led you to your conclusion about reincarnation oh yeah um i mean it, so it started when i was thinking about the multiverse right and uh which started because i read leonard suskin's book about it called the cosmic landscape <laughs> and so you know and he starts talking about how if there's a multiverse then there's going to be like copies of you in other universes far away, right? And um, okay, and like, oh, that's weird. And like, there could be one who's really similar to you. Okay, but then I realized that, um, you know, you don't need a multiverse for that. You can just have time. If you have enough time, then there's going to be another copy of you at some time in the future. Okay, and then I started to think about, well, if there's another copy of you, like there's, if at some future time there is a, physical body that is produced that is extremely physically similar to yours when you were born, I started to think, will that be you? 
maybe that will literally be you, right? Maybe it will literally be me when there's the copy of me. Um, so, you know, I thought about that and then thought, well, like, so what are the conditions for a thing to be me? And um, you, you might think, well, maybe it has to be like an exact duplicate, like, you know, so it has to be a single point in the configuration space. Okay, and then the probability of that is zero because, you know, a point, so there's a space of possible configurations of human bodies, so to speak, and it's continuous. And so a single point in it occupies 0% of the total volume. So the probability of hitting the same point again is zero. Okay. So if you think that, then there's zero probability of my occurring again in the future. However, if you think that, then there was also zero probability of my being here now. So I shouldn't be here, right? And then, okay. So if it's a non-zero region, then there's a non-zero chance of my being here now, but then there's also a non-zero chance of my occurring at a future time. <laughs> okay, so that was sort of the thinking that I was having. So basically, like, if you have infinite time, anything with a non-zero probability will recur. And anything with a zero probability shouldn't happen. Okay, so your being born is either a zero probability event or a non-zero probability event. If it's a zero probability event, you shouldn't be here. So that and, but you right. are here, so that refutes that. Right. If it's a non-zero probability event, then it should occur again, given infinite time. Um, so you do think the universe is in, is past infinite as well as infinite in the future? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you outline a little bit why it's the case that like, if we have infinite time, then anything with a non-zero probability is going to happen infinite times? I mean... Could, isn't it at least like conceptually possible that something with a non-zero probability, like it could happen once, like my existence could happen once and then just never happen again? Um, yeah, but the probability of that is zero. <laughs> so, okay, so, you know, it's a, it's a logically possible but zero probability um, possibility. Okay, so you're like, oh, okay, well then, I don't know, what <laughs> does it matter that it's possible? Well, like epistemologically, you know, from the standpoint of making inferences, um, what matters is the probability. So if you have a theory that says that there's this zero probability event that has happened, then you have the strongest possible evidence for rejecting that theory. Right. Okay? And if you have a theory that says, you know, so whatever. So like um, if there's a non-zero probability of your recur recurring in a given finite time period and there's infinite future time, then your expectation of occurring again should be one, hmm. even though it's logically possible that it won't happen. Right. So it's logically possible that I could flip a coin infinitely and it would come up tails literally every single time infinitely, <laughs> yeah. but I should not yeah. believe that that will actually happen. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, like if somebody purported to have flipped a coin infinitely many times and they got all tails, um, you should have the strongest possible disbelief in their report. <laughs> I see. <laughs> um, so, like, to what extent are you putting, you know, cognitive and psychological attributes, like, uh, to what extent are you placing those in the soul? Like, I know that it's, you know, the seat of consciousness and personal identity. Um, you know, you mentioned reason and free will. But, like, to what extent are our cognitive abilities and psychological attributes, on your view, like, you know, are those, like, in the soul as opposed to in the brain? Yeah, I mean, most of them are in the brain. So most of the things that people think are essential properties of themselves are not. And, okay, and then, you know, they're like trivial things like, um, uh, you know, your race and your sex. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, in fact, contingent properties of you. So you could have a different race and sex. And then, like, it's kind of trivial to see that. Okay, so like, well, like, somebody could take your current body and they could modify it. Like, you know, you could go through a sex change operation. You could go through gene therapy that change your chromosomes or whatever, and then you could become the other sex at a different race, whatever. So you, okay, don't think but, we, you don't think we have feminine souls or uh, or white souls or something? No. Okay. Uh, although, you know, masculine versus feminine is more plausible because there are more character differences. Hmm. But um, but no, I think like a person who's one gender could have been the other one. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, like, you know, all it would have taken was in the womb for you to have had different hormones yeah. you know, that the fetus was exposed to. Of course, that assumes that your soul was already in there. <laughs> right. So maybe that would have caused a different soul to appear. But anyway, whatever. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So, but uh, the way that we know that um, most of your cognitive abilities are um, in your brain, so to speak, is well, people sometimes get brain damage. 
you know, you could say, okay, and then, you know, they lose cognitive abilities and you could say, oh, well, maybe then like their soul left and a different soul entered the body. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I can't refute that. I don't have a test of that, but I guess the simplest view is it's the same soul, but okay. Then the person has fewer cognitive abilities. So it was dependent on their brain. Um, and then you're like, okay, what about personality traits? Well, you can have significant changes in personality due to, um, just like, you know, chemicals in your brain. So like, um, you give people certain drugs and like their personality changes. And then, um, you know, there could be cases where you get brain damage and your personality changes. And so like a lot of what we think of as, um, your character is really just its dispositions to feel certain ways. And so like the reason why people with different character traits behave differently is mostly, I think, that they have different feelings. They have different emotional reactions, which they're not really choosing in the same circumstances, okay? So like the person who you say is aggressive, what's really happening is just like there are chemicals in your brain that cause anger, and that person gets more of them in more circumstances than the person who's unaggressive. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the same kinds of arguments that physicalists will say as, um, I mean, uh, conclusive proof of their position. Um, so can you like, you know, what is the distinction between using an argument like that to say, well, you know, cognitive abilities are largely a matter of brain processing, but the fact that it's like something to exist is not a matter of brain processing. You know, it's just that the, the brain, uh, brain states cause mental states. And so like, you know, it's not that surprising that there are all these, that damage to the brain you know, diminishes your mental capacities, right? It's not mm -hmm. that weird. You know, maybe, maybe the question is like, oh, well, like, why can't we explain everything by saying that the brain states just are the mental states? I, w I would just like repeat the arguments for dualism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, you know, like repeat the Thomas Nagel thing. And then like, you know, the, we didn't do the Je Frank Jackson thing, but, you know, you imagine like uh, somebody having um, all of the brain science knowledge about like what brain state somebody is in when they see blue, but they're completely colorblind. Okay, so that person doesn't know what it's like to see blue, even though they know all the facts about the brain configuration. So what it's like to see blue is not just a purely physical state. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a Nagel type argument against, um, you know, trying to argue for like the uh, like non-physicality of your personality attributes, you know, or like the non-physicality of um, like aggressive behavior. You know, yeah, yeah. there is for like the feeling of uh, aggression, um, but just not for like, uh, you know, the things that you like, the dispositions to behave a certain way that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, the the argument about character traits, well, like character traits are reducible. And um, well, I'm not saying they're reducible to brain states. I'm saying they're reducible to dispositions to have certain mental states. Okay, but those dispositions are because of the psychophysical laws are going to be grounded in uh, configurations of your brain. Yeah. Um, so when you're talking about reincarnation, are you just strictly talking about reincarnation of the soul? So it is it is the same person, or are you talking about reincarnation of the soul plus a bunch of qualitative characteristics? Oh yeah. So I don't know how many of your qualitative characteristics will be repeated. <laughs> so, because I don't know what the conditions are for your soul to go into a body. Mm. So it could be that next time, it could be like, you know, the next time you're incarnated, you'll be extremely similar to your current self, or it could be that you'll be quite different. I don't even know whether you could be incarnated as a member of another, like a non-intelligent species, you know, mm. like, can you come back as a cat? I don't really know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have like the intuitive sense that there are some aspects of your character that you couldn't be lacking. I just have an intuitive sense that if you imagine somebody sufficiently different from me qualitatively, it couldn't really be me. Hmm. But I, I, don't, I don't really have any empirical evidence to establish that. And, you know, it might be impossible to have empirical evidence of that. I have some questions from the audience. Uh, we got quite a lot of questions, actually, but I'm going to try to just pick a few of them here. Um, this one is from Atheopagan Gab. They say, I would ask if he has any opinions on topics like embodiment and spatial extension, like whether minds are capable of disembodied existence and whether minds literally occupy space and so forth. For example, E.J. Lowe would deny disembodiment and affirm spatial extension. Oh, okay. So I'm, um, uh, I guess, so in my view, there's no spatial properties. Um, 
of minds, but uh, they can be disembodied. They can be embodied. <laughs> and what it means to be embodied is just that um, there's a reliable set of causal connections between a particular body and a particular mind's mental states. However, that gets established when that happens, then you're embodied and you become disembodied when the causal connections to um, a, a physical body are broken. I okay, see. so, uh, you know, during the, during the time in between your incarnations, you exist as a disembodied soul. So when you, when you talk about embodiment, okay, that's actually really helpful because I think a lot of people are imagining like, like you're possessing your body and it's like your soul literally is like, you know, it's like a, a brain shaped soul basically, or something like that. It's yeah, like yeah. animating you or something. Yeah. Um, your soul yeah. is not spatially in your body. When we say the soul is in the body, we just mean that it's causally interacting with the body. Yeah. Um, so this next question relates to that as well. This is from Amos Wallen, who said, what best explains the psychophysical laws pairing particular souls to particular brains? Oh, um, I don't know. You mean like why, the, why the laws exist at all? Like nobody knows. Yeah. Right. However, you know, like, as I mentioned earlier in this discussion, like, um, nobody knows why any of the laws exist actually. Right. So we don't know why there's gravitation. We don't know why there's quantum mechanics or whatever. So I don't know. And that, as a matter of fact, I don't even have any idea of how you could explain such a thing. You know, like sometimes you could derive a law from other laws, but then that just pushes the question back to why the other laws exist. So why do the fundamental laws exist? I don't even have an idea of what could possibly be an explanation. God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe God made them. Okay. But then how did he do that? So like God, so he, he did something. You perform some action, maybe you have some thought, and then that caused there to be a law of nature. Okay, and then, so that causal connection right there, the one between God's thought and the law, what governs that causal connection? Yeah, That's why did be he like choose law. that law? <laughs> like, so, um, so laws yeah. of nature are just fundamental causal principles. They're just the fundamental principles that describe the causal relations. So if God could create a law of nature, there would be a causal connection between something that he did and the law of nature, so then that would have to be governed by a law. So right. then what made that law? <laughs> he said, let there be light. And um, there was psychophysical harmony already in place. So then light actually appeared instead of, um, I don't know, a toucan or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that could, that could happen, right? So like, that could be true. But then, you know, we still, we had to originally have the law between God saying, let there be light and there being light. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, I feel like, he might be asking as well just about pairing. Like a lot of people ask about this, you know, like um, uh, why couldn't it be? Like why does one soul occupy a body at a time? And like why is it with that particular body? Like could we switch souls? Um, yeah, so I mean, what do you think about those kinds of like body switching cases or objections about, well, you know, why is it just paired to this one body and, you know, why this particular body and so on? Yeah, uh, so I don't know. Uh, nobody knows. But, I mean, like, you know, the only hypothesis I have is that a particular soul requires a particular type of brain, like a particular brain configuration, which in fact happened at the time that you were conceived or, well, when your brain was first formed, or maybe a little bit later when it started functioning at a certain level, you know, there was the right configuration for your soul to occupy it. I don't know. Um, this is a really good question, though, <laughs> like, uh, which we need more, uh, we need scientific investigation of, but I'm not sure if we can investigate it. Um, sometimes people, you know, wonder if like your soul could have left your body and been replaced by a different soul. Okay. And the answer is that is metaphysically possible and there would be no way of detecting that. Right. So like, you know, the new soul would think that it has been here for the whole time. It wouldn't know that it, it was a newcomer. And then the old soul wouldn't think anything because it's no longer embodied. <laughs> and it's, okay, so that's metaphysically possible. I can't refute that. And I think there's no empirical test of that. Um, and some people think that that's an objection to the whole um, theory about souls. Okay, but I would point out that I think that that's perfectly parallel to the idea that like, okay, this microphone could have been replaced by all different matter. Mm -hmm. in the last second and there would be no way of detecting that so like, okay so like you know maybe there were just like different particles here the the original particles disappeared and were replaced by different particles with the same properties in the same configuration and there is no way of detecting that either so right but we assume that that probably didn't happen because i don't know i don't i'm not sure exactly <laughs> why but we just assume that stuff like that didn't happen unless there's some reason to think it did yeah 
Yeah. Um, I remember you saying in the book, you were like, you know, some people think this is an annoying feature of dualism, but maybe it's just an annoying feature of reality. Yeah. Like, we, we can't know like everything that we might want to know, but that doesn't mean that dualism isn't still like the best explanation of, you know, personal identity and subjectivity and so on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, don't, don't confuse inconvenience with evidence. <laughs> you know, like, this theory has an inconvenient or annoying feature. It doesn't make us happy or satisfy our goals. Don't confuse that with the theory not being true. Um, this question comes from John Steingard, who said, I seem to recall him saying souls are eternal on his view. Could he address where he thinks they are before they apparently attach to a body? Uh, yeah, nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. <laughs> they're not spatially located. So uh, they have no spatial properties because they're non-physical. And, you know... And I guess only physical things have spatial properties. So, hmm. um, and then they start interact or they start um, exhibiting these causal connections at some point with sufficiently complex uh, physical activity. Yeah. So, uh, one more question here. This is uh, from the Relay Theology podcast, and um, I think they're referring to your debate with Graham Oppie about uh, dualism against materialism? Question mark Because he seems like he was kind of an emergentist, but. Um, uh, so Relay Theology said, while substance dualism may be compatible with atheism, I wonder how he feels about a Bayesian argument where substance dualism is more expected on theism um, and is so, uh, you know, evidence for theism. So, um, you know, I guess theism, I say theism is just a view that God exists, but God isn't a physical object on anyone's view, right? Or a physical state or anything else physical. So like theism entails dualism, right? <laughs> Um, so, okay. And even if he hadn't made us, dualism would still be true. So, okay. So it's true that, all right, you know, probability of dualism given theism is greater than probability of dualism given atheism. Okay. <laughs> but, it's, you know, but I also think the probability of dualism given atheism is really high. It's not as high because it's not a hundred percent, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I oh I I should probably mention um Mormons do believe as far as I can tell that God like has a body um, um and is not but um I mean oh, they're yeah, more yeah that's good maybe yeah they, maybe some theists thought that God was a physical being yeah at least partly or I mean it's their view is uh, hard to they have an, they have an interesting philosophy of mind actually or, or at least their like early philosophers did but um they uh. Uh, the, my problem with that kind of argument, though, is that I don't think God neatly fits into the category of like, oh, well, God has a soul, you know, or is a soul or something. Because when you, I mean, yeah, he's a non-physical being, but when you start adding like, a, you know, divine attributes to him, it's, it sounds less and less like a soul to me where it's like, oh, he's the metaphysically necessary foundation of reality and the sustainer of everything that exists at every moment. It's like, and he's exact. He has a soul like I do, or he is a, like that's just a regular ass soul doing all that shit. Like, I, it seems like God and me are like fundamentally different categories. So it just seems weird to say like, oh, God is a soul and I'm a soul. It's like I feel like God's his own thing. So I don't see how it could raise the probability. I guess. I mean, he's traditionally understood to be a, a soul. I guess in Western philosophy. If you say he has a soul, then the argument works. But I just am not right. so convinced that, like, even Descartes would say he had a soul. Like, it seems like he's his own substance. Well, I mean, yeah. Why is God a soul? Why does he have a soul? Well, uh, you remember what we were saying about the souls? Like, there's uh, qualia, intentionality, and free will. God has those things. Right. He's a soul. Right. And I mean, you might think he's a different kind of soul because is like much more powerful than us if he exists. And, but, you know, by the way, like, like a lot of the stuff that you hear about God, I, I feel like people didn't fully think through like how it works. So um, <laughs> like, is it, okay. So there's a, there's a particular conscious being um, who's God. Does he know that he's God? Like, well, of course he's got to know that because he knows everything. Okay. Does he know it with certainty? Like, and I guess the theist would say, yeah, he knows everything with certainty. Well, how could he know all that with certainty? Because like, you know, God can go through the sort of reflections in Descartes' meditations, right? He could yeah, think, yeah. oh, maybe there's a deceiving God who's deceiving me into thinking that I'm God. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not. <laughs> like, and then, like, I don't see how God could know for certain 
you know, that he was all of the stuff that he is, right? Yeah. And then, yeah, and then you also think like, oh, you know, how God's supposed to have created the universe. Well, how did he do that? And then, like, there's never any answer to that. Like, what was the mechanism? Because I know how I create things, like, whatever, I create a book, like, I used a computer to do it. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you know, people cut down some trees in order to make a paper or whatever. <laughs> like, okay, what did God do to create the world? Like, I don't know, he just said, but I'm going to make a world. Let's just let there be a world, okay? But mm -hmm. generally, it's not like the words, right? Maybe it's just like he thinks to himself, he wants there to be a world. Okay. Well, he's got to be really lucky because there have to be the right psychophysical laws that connect his mental states to the creation of matter. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, a lot of it seems improbable, I guess. Yeah. I would say. And I mean, he's also timeless, as we're reminded often, you know, by people who defend the Kalam or something. But it's weird to say that he's a conscious being who exists totally outside of time. Like he's, you know, timeless in the same way numbers are timeless, but he's conscious and yeah, has I mean, thoughts. Yeah. This makes no sense to me, right? <laughs> like, uh, you know, can okay. So if you're if you're a conscious being, um, and you know, God is supposed to have mental states. So like sometimes he gets angry, sometimes he has whatever he has beliefs, he has knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know what it's like to have a mental state but not have it at any time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then, but, and also like, okay, so God was supposed to have created stuff. And according to the Kalam people, so, you know, like, I think time is infinite. So I don't think God created time. It just goes back forever. Okay. But according to some theists, time had a beginning and God created it. And like, how did he do that? I don't know. He did something like he formed an intention in his mind for there to be time. And then that caused time to come into existence. Okay. That doesn't make any sense. Because if there's no time to begin with, then there's no causation. And also, like, he can't form an intention because that's an event that happens at a time. <laughs> like, right. Nothing can happen if there's no time. So in particular, the event of somebody creating time can't happen. Yeah. And if you, I mean, the way I hear some people try to get around this is say, well, it all kind of happened at one moment. Like, if you can see, like, if you can imagine, like, a four-dimensional space-time block or something, that's how God experiences things. It's like everything all at once. And it's like, well, you can't have just one moment, you know, where everything happens for God. Like, you can't have even one moment. <laughs> like, he's outside of time. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just like... You know, I just don't, you know, just don't know again, like what it would be like to have the mental state. And, and, and like, theists are often sort of like unconcerned about incomprehensibility. They're like, ah, oh, yeah, it's a big mystery. Well, okay, maybe it's a big mystery, or maybe you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? <laughs> like, isn't that the simpler explanation? Like, we can't understand it because you don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that seems to be a big, uh, you know, fork in the road for atheists and for theists. It's like, yeah, it's a mystery. And then they like, you know, they're like, yeah, it's amazing. It's a mystery. And then I'm like, that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I can't, like, I can't even believe that. I don't, I don't understand what it would mean to believe that when I don't even know what that is. Um, right, yeah. <laughs> like, if I did believe in God, I feel like I would have to believe in like a finitist, you know, limited God who exists, you know, in time and probably uh didn't create time <laughs> like the universe is infinite and he formed things out of pre-existing material or something like he didn't create ex nihilo and i think you could still have something that looks like a god even with those uh traits but it wouldn't be the kind of god that most christians believe in yeah yeah you know when people ask me i say i'm agnostic you know what i mean is um i think the universe could have been created by an intelligent being but i don't think that the being could have all the characteristics that are traditionally ascribed to god so, like, uh, I, I doubt that omniscience is possible. I don't think omnipotence is possible. But there could be a highly knowledgeable and highly powerful being who could have created the, the physical universe we see around us. And he couldn't have created everything because he couldn't create himself, but he could have created this stuff that we see around us. Yeah, I think that um, that might be a good place to, uh, to end. I mean, I really appreciate you coming on, and um, I like that you're... It seems like you're writing more about philosophy of mind. Is that my perception or is that true? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I recently wrote that, that paper that you were talking about, about um, the problem of other minds. And, you know, I might do more in the future because I haven't written a book about philosophy of mind yet. And, you know, it, it was one of the things that first interested me about philosophy.
I just wanted to understand why there was any consciousness at all. The unfortunate part is that I never really found out because nobody knows. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess my intro to philosophy had a lot to do with Sam Harris because I was like a young evangelical teenager who like deconverted and became an atheist and got into like new atheism for a short time. Um, and Sam Harris is a huge like Thomas Nagel fan and David Chalmers fan, and he kind of pointed me in that direction. And um, I had no idea that my views were as influenced by him as um, as they were until I learned more about philosophy of mind. And yeah, anyway, he, he had a lot to do, I think, with me becoming kind of like Nagel pilled and, you know, kind of in line with Chalmers and stuff. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a good podcaster. You know, <laughs> I've heard some of his episodes and they're fun. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Remember, everybody, buy my book. Buy the books created by fake news provider. Um, don't be distracted by the name. It's all. <laughs> and also check out my blog, Fake News. 